Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. We return to our study in Corinthians this morning. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Please follow along in your Bibles or on the screen beside me. Receive now God's word. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we share this rightful, if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offering? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, the very last verse of the previous passage, Paul had boldly asserted that, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. And as was pointed out, the Greek literally says, I will never eat meat forever. For Paul, this was a no-brainer. Is eating food offered to idols going to cause my brother to sin? Is it going to lead him back into idolatry? Does it have the potential of destroying his soul? Well, then what is there to think about? I will just give it up. After all, it is only food. The Corinthians were saying, what's the big deal? Why can't we eat? But Paul says in response, what's the big deal? Why can't you just not eat? Both Paul and the Corinthians had the same knowledge. They both knew that idols weren't real and that therefore food offered to idols technically was no different from any other food. Both had knowledge, but only one had love. Because of love, Paul was mindful of the fact that not all knew what he knew. He was mindful of those with a weak conscience. We spent quite a bit of time understanding just exactly what that means. I won't rehash that whole discussion here, but suffice to say the weak refers to those whose conscience, because of their prolonged exposure to certain habits and ways of thinking, is not yet firmly convinced of what it knows to be true. Paul was mindful of the weak. He understood that his actions impacted others, that he'd been called to live not in isolation, but in a community of believers, and that he was accountable to each and every one of his brothers and sisters. Their edification was his burden. Well, as we were going through the scripture reading just a moment ago, you may have been thinking, this kind of seems like a tangent. One minute Paul's talking about idol food. The next minute he's talking about rights as an apostle to be supported. What is the connection? 
And if that's what you were thinking, then let me just applaud you because that means you're engaged with the text. The connection is not immediately evident, but once you see it, I think you'll agree with me that the transition from 8 to 9 is fairly natural. Paul has just said, I will never eat meat forever. Unless the Corinthians think that Paul's exaggerating, that this is mere rhetoric, he's about to put his money where his mouth is, so to speak. You see, as a matter of fact, Paul has already sacrificed food for the sake of others. And so in chapter 9, he moves away from explanation, he moves away from exhortation, and he moves to example. He offers his own example as a model that he would have the Corinthians imitate. This is implied in our chapter, but explicitly spelled out at the very end of this larger section in chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So he's wanting to teach by example, because as one theologian rightly observes, knowledge can be taught, but love needs to be shown. Knowledge can be taught, but love needs to be shown. The Corinthians already have knowledge. What they need is love. Well, here's what we're going to see from Paul's example, from his life. You can understand this as the overarching point of the entirety of chapter 9. For Paul, the advancement of the gospel is his number one priority. That is the thing that totally dominates his life so that he is willing to relinquish all of his rights for the sake of that gospel. That's what chapter 9 is all about, relinquishing one's rights for the sake of the gospel. And if you think about that even just a little bit, you will realize that that is also the key to this overarching issue of food offered to idols. Now, in the first 14 verses, which is our passage this morning, here's how Paul approaches this. Here's his plan of attack. First of all, he begins by establishing his rights, by unleashing a series of rhetorical questions that make it irrefutable that he does, in fact, enjoy certain rights. Then, almost as an anticlimax, he proceeds to say in verse 12, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. So, in a sense, you could say that our entire passage this morning is an extended argument in which Paul establishes his rights, and he does this in roughly three parts. These will be our three points. First, Paul makes an argument from common practice. Second, Paul makes an argument from scriptures. And third, he makes an argument from the words of our Lord Jesus himself. So those will be our three points. But before we begin, let's pray. One more time. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your text now, give us the eyes to see wonderful things in this law. As we take a look at Paul's example today and in the weeks to come, we ask that you would give us the humility to follow him, to, to follow his example, understanding that he followed Christ. As his model, as his sacrifice challenges us, may it not just leave us simply admiring the Apostle Paul, but may you strengthen us to imitate him. Father, we ask for your help. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This passage, as I think you've probably noticed, is kind of an awkward text to try to preach on because in it, Paul poses no less than 17 rhetorical questions. That's 17 questions in 14 verses. The whole thing is basically a series of questions. Each question more or less making the same exact point, so that to the readers, this does feel like overkill. Three to five questions I can understand, but goodness gracious, 17 questions. It is a very particular text, which naturally makes you wonder, what is Paul up to? Why this overkill? 
There's a couple of reasons why Paul structures this passage in the way that he does. First of all, the nature of what he wants to say is somewhat delicate. On the one hand, Paul needs to assert or establish his rights in order to make the more ultimate point that the Christian ought to be willing to relinquish those rights. But on the other hand, that is a tricky thing to do because asserting oneself can easily come off as boasting. And that is definitely not a precedent that Paul wants to set, especially not for this boastful church. Just imagine the alternative. Imagine if Paul wrote this passage in the form of statements. Here's what that would sound like. I am free. I am an apostle. I have seen Jesus our Lord. You are my workmanship in the Lord, and so on and so forth. I mean, that sounds totally ridiculous, doesn't it? And so by asking questions rather than making statements, Paul is able to assert himself without directly asserting himself. Second, that still doesn't answer the question of why so many. Again, isn't this overkill? Yes, it is, but deliberately so. Because it is precisely that overkill, that redundancy, that Paul makes, us, that makes Paul's assertions all the more irrefutable. And the more irrefutable something is, the more undeniable that I definitely deserve to enjoy certain rights, the more weight there is to my willingness to let it go. So here's the payoff. By the time we get to verse 12, not only has Paul increased the weight of his sacrifice, but in doing so, he has increased the pressure upon the Corinthians to follow suit. That is the rhetorical impact of this passage. You read it and you can't help but think to yourself, oh my goodness, if Paul is willing to sacrifice in that way, I can certainly sacrifice more. That's what Paul is after. He is beckoning the Corinthians to follow his example. Well, getting into the actual text now, in the first two questions, Paul introduces the topics of concern. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? One, freedom, and two, rights as an apostle. In today's passage, the focus will be upon the latter. In the following passage, especially starting in verse 19, if you take a look, the focus will shift to this concept of Christian freedom. Paul begins by reminding the Corinthians of his apostleship. Two things validate his calling. First, he has seen the Lord, and second, the faith of the Corinthians themselves. Now, as we clearly see in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, when the disciples were deciding who to select to replace Judas, the criteria set forth was that the man be someone who had been with the disciples from the beginning, an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. Paul, of course, encountered the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, and in that encounter, Christ gave him the specific charge of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Second, the Corinthians themselves. Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Paul appeals here to the Corinthians' affections, to their relationship. The Corinthians came to Christ. They were converted as a result of Paul's preaching so that his effectiveness in Corinth confirms his calling as the apostle to the Gentiles. You are the seal of my apostleship. A seal is a signet which validates the authenticity of the author and contents of a letter. Analogously, the very existence of this church validates Paul's ministry. So now that Paul has established the fact that he's an apostle, he moves on to establish the rights that he has as an apostle. Verse 3. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? This is point number one. Paul first makes an argument from common practice. Now, each of these questions are related to the aspect of receiving support. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? There's an obvious reason why Paul begins with this right. It is related to food. And so we can't help but draw a correlation with this and the topic of food offered to idols. Paul is implicitly inviting the Corinthians to draw a parallel between his rights and theirs. 
Having said that the two aren't the same, Paul's not talking about idol foods per se. He's just talking about basic necessities, eating and drinking. The idea being that the apostles had the right to receive daily provisions from the church that they were serving, not just bread and water, but whatever they needed to simply live, to survive. Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife? The impression that we get from this second question is that the accepted practice amongst the apostles, the norm, was to visit churches not just by themselves, but with their wives. To take along isn't referring to getting married, it's referring to traveling together. So when Peter went to Galatia, for example, to guest speak for the churches in that province, his wife was also there, supporting him, praying for him, simply providing him with companionship. And Peter could expect that the churches would provide food and drink, not just for him, but also for his wife and presumably his children, children as well. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Unlike the apostle Peter, Paul had to work for a living. He was bivocational, a tent maker by day, pastor by night. His mention of Barnabas indicates that, that was also the case for him. Paul worked not because he wanted to, not because he wanted some extra cash in his pockets, but Paul worked because he needed to survive. He worked in order to provide for his own basic necessities because he didn't want to be, be, be a cause of stumbling to the Corinthians. We'll talk about what that means later on. But guess what? Since his ministry to the Corinthians was his priority, there were days when Paul went without food. In his list of travails, Paul mentions how he was often in hunger and in need. So when push came to shove, when he didn't have enough time to do both tent making and ministry, ministry always won. Paul asks, is Barnabas and I the only ones who have to live like this? If you're the Corinthians, I don't know how you could read this without being pierced to your heart. Because of your shortcoming, Paul has suffered. Because of your greed, Paul has sacrificed. Because of your worldliness, Paul has chosen to give up this world. By the way, this isn't the main point of the passage, but indirectly, Paul does provide here certain principles that we ought to apply when it comes to the question of how we should provide for our ministers. For those, as Paul later puts it in verse 14, who gain, gain their living by the gospel. A church should strive to provide all the daily essentials of their ministers and their family. So to put that more technically, a pastor's salary should be sufficient to cover all of his needs. You don't want him constantly worrying about how am I going to get food? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to send my kids to college? You want him to be able to focus upon preaching and teaching. That benefits him and that also benefits the church. But returning to our text, verse 7. Here's three more questions. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruits? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? We have here yet another set of three questions, each beginning with the word who, who serves as a soldier, who plants a vineyard, who tends a flock. The expected answer in each case is no one. No one labors for nothing. In other words, regardless of the vocation, it is common practice for your work to be the means of your sustenance. Why should it be any different for Paul? Furthermore, notice that in each case, the form of compensation is derived intrinsically from the work itself. A soldier can expect his expenses to be taken care of. That word is better translated as rations, meaning food rations. So the soldier receives his rations. The vine dresser his fruits. The shepherd his milk. Ration fruit and milk. Once again, all of those are related to food and drink. So that the topic of idle food is never too far from the reader's mind. Now, all of this may be painfully obvious to you, but that's the point. Of course, Paul has this right. Not just because he's an apostle, but because that's the way things work no matter what you do. It is an inalienable right, to put it in familiar terms, that a man be allowed to work and that he receives fair wages for that work. So point number one, an argument from common practice, 
And now point number two, an argument from Scripture, verse 8. Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Everything Paul just said, he now supports with Scripture. What he says, the law also says. The passage that he quotes, by the way, is Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. You may want to write that down in your margins if it's not already there. Deuteronomy 25, 4. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Now, at first, that seems unrelated. What does muzzling an ox have to do with a man's rights? Well, you have to be familiar with this imagery to get this. Back in the day, during harvest, harvest time, when the Israelite farmers wanted to separate the grains from the husk, what they would do is they would gather all the wheat into one area. They would get an ox, tie a big stone to that ox, and basically have it walk around in circles pulling that stone. Then as that stone crushed the wheat, the grain would be separated from the husk. Well, in Deuteronomy 25.4, Moses says, when an ox is treading the grain, when it's pulling that heavy stone around and around in circles, don't put a muzzle on it. In other words, let the ox eat some of the grain as it's treading it out. The ox deserves it. It would be inhumane for you to make that beast do all the work without being able to enjoy some of the fruits of its own labor. So I think you can see the argument now. This is an argument from the lesser to the greater. If Moses, if God, was concerned enough about animals to lay down these kinds of instructions, how much more does that principle apply to human beings? So Paul goes on to say in the middle of verse 9, Is it for oxen that God's concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. Paul's not saying that Deuteronomy 25 has nothing to do with oxen. It obviously pertains to them. But Deuteronomy 25, along with every other passage in the Bible, was ultimately written for the edification of men. So this is the way that Martin Luther paraphrases this passage. He says, This verse was obviously not written for oxen, since oxen cannot read. As Paul says elsewhere, all scripture, even this scripture on ox, is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. So you need this passage as well in order to be complete. A plowman should plow in hope. A thresher should thresh in hope. I think this is probably the best scripture to turn to when you're defending the notion of an inalienable right. This is an important principle to uphold, that man should be given the dignity to labor in hope. It is hope that makes toil and hard labor bearable. It invites you to look beyond your present circumstances, and as a matter of fact, hope can even have the powerful effect of transforming what's an otherwise miserable experience into something that is incredibly meaningful. I was reminded of Jacob in Genesis chapter 29. Jacob unjustly slaves away for his uncle Laban, but those oppressive years seemed to him but a few days. Remember that phrase? They were but a few days. Why? Because Jacob had hope that he would get married to Rachel. To rob a man of this hope would therefore reduce him to nothing but a machine. Lower than an animal. Nothing but a machine, an instrument designed to exclusively serve the interests of the owner. That's what we would call inhumane. To subject someone to this kind of treatment would therefore be unbiblical. It is not a coincidence that slavery was abolished in large part due to the efforts of Christians who argued for the humanity of slaves based on passages such as Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 11. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, 
do not we even more? If you remember, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul had used the metaphor of farming to describe his ministry in Corinth. The Corinthians were like the field, and Paul was like the farmer. He planted, Apollos watered, and what happened? God gave the growth. Paul was blessed with spiritual fruits. If Paul has sown spiritual things and has reaped a spiritual harvest, is it too much to, re to reap material things which are less important, less valuable than the spiritual? No, of course it's not. Of course a minister can expect some kind of compensation for his labors of sowing the infinitely more valuable seed of the gospel. Are you getting tired of this yet? And starting to get repetitive? Well, again, that's kind of the point, so hang in there. An argument from common practice, an argument from scripture. Last but not least, point number three, an argument from the Lord. I'm going to take this last section out of order, so skip down with me to verse 13. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. There's that question again. Do you not know? To remind you, the Corinthians thought themselves to be knowledgeable people. And so every time Paul asks, do you not know, which he does several times throughout this letter, there's a tinge of sarcasm there that's meant to sting the Corinthians. Don't you know this, Paul says, that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple. Paul now moves from the secular to the sacred. Even in the sacred realm, those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple. Those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offering. Right after a priest made an animal sacrifice, a portion of that meat went to himself. So once again, we have here yet another instance in which support is derived intrinsically from the work itself. And by the way, this applies to both Judaism and paganism. Even pagans had the sense of propriety to allow their priests to make a living from their work. How much more should we as Christians desire to provide for the needs of those who minister to us? In the same way, verse 14, the Lord commanded, by Lord, Paul is meaning to say Jesus, Jesus commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Now the question is, of course, where did Jesus say that? Well, as far as we know, Jesus never explicitly said those exact words. But most scholars agree that Paul's here drawing out an implication from what Jesus taught in passages such as Mark chapter 6, Matthew 10, and Luke 9. Those are parallel passages. You'll remember that when Jesus first sent his 12 disciples out on a mission to spread the gospel, he instructed them to take basically nothing. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no second tunic. In other words, he sent them with insufficient provisions so that they might learn to trust in God and depend upon the provisions of those who received the gospel from them. Jesus taught the same thing more explicitly this time in Luke chapter 10 when he sends out the 72. There he instructed them to remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. The reason why it's a fairly good assumption that in our passage Paul's alluding to those passages in the Gospels is because of what Paul says elsewhere in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn with me there if you have your Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy 5, starting in verse 17, Paul writes, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Then take a look at verse 18. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. In a passage in which Paul is talking about the compensation of elders, of pastors, he quotes Deuteronomy 25.4, which is also quoted in our passage. 
And then right after that, he quotes Jesus from Luke chapter 10, verse 7. What that tells us is that in Paul's mind, those two passages teach the same principle. All of that to say, the Lord's command, Jesus' command, is more than likely a reference to those passages in the gospel, such as Luke chapter 10. So from those texts, here's the implication that Paul draws out. Those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Now, yes, every Christian is called to proclaim the gospel. But Paul is obviously referring to those whose primary job is to do that very thing, whether that's the apostles or Barnabas or Apollos or Paul or even certain elders within the church. They should get their living by the gospel. In other words, the church should allow the proclamation of the gospel to be that person's primary means of putting food on the table. So let's circle back to the beginning now. The whole point of this entire passage is Paul seeking to establish his rights. Paul is entitled to enjoy certain rights. Common practice dictates this. Scriptures dictate this. And Jesus dictates this. Paul has gone to great lengths to emphatically make the point that this is irrefutable and even inalienable so that for Paul not to receive his wages would be inhumane. Even the beasts of the field, even the dumb ox gets its grain to deprive a human being, let alone an apostle of Christ, of food and drink, of basic necessities is unthinkable. And now we can look at verse 12. Nevertheless, we've not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. you get the picture? I want you to pay attention here to what Paul says. If you've fallen asleep because of the repetitive nature of this sermon, I don't blame you. I kind of understand at least this one time. Here's where you have to focus. This is now the heart of this passage. Nevertheless, we've not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Let me just highlight two words for you. In the ESV, it's the words anything and an. That's A-N, an obstacle. Those two words are better translated as all things and no. All things and no. The ESV's translation fails to preserve the contrast that Paul is deliberately making here. So here's the sense. Paul says, we endure all things, everything and anything, so that we will cause no hindrance, so as to remove even the slightest obstacle to the gospel. So here's how one scholar puts it. Paul is willing to go to the greatest lengths in order to avoid the very least of hindrances to the progress of the gospel. The greatest lengths, so Paul is even willing to starve to give up his most basic human rights if it means removing even the very least of obstacles. It's one thing if there's a huge obstacle to the gospel then most definitely we understand why Paul would give an arm and a leg for it. That makes sense to us. But even if there's a tiny obstacle, Paul would do the same. Now there's a glaring question that surfaces here, and that's this. If every apostle is entitled to receive adequate support from the church that they're serving, and yet if Paul refused to receive support from the Corinthians, that can only mean one thing, right? It means that Paul perceived his receiving support from this church as an obstacle to the advancement of the gospel in Corinth. So the question is, how so? Why did Paul judge that his receiving support would hinder the gospel? The most natural assumption for us to make would be to say, well, the Corinthians must not have been in a financially stable situation. Simply put, they couldn't afford to support Paul. And now, if that was the case, that is a major obstacle, isn't it? For Paul to insist upon some kind of compensation in that kind of circumstance would present an insurmountable obstacle to the gospel. But that is not why Paul refused support. 
although we cannot be certain as to the details, scholars more or less unanimously agree that this was intimately tied with the Corinthian culture. The city of Corinth, as we've learned in previous sermons and passages, was driven by what can be described as a patronage system. The giving and receiving of gifts was not so simple and innocent as one person wanting to be generous to another. Rather, it was part of a much larger culture whereby relationships and obligations were created and maintained. Let me read you a quote from Peter Marshall, who has done extensive research on this very aspect of the city of Corinth. He writes, The offer of a gift constituted an offer of friendship. While in theory it was voluntary and disinterested, it was intended to place the recipient under an obligation to repay. Acceptance was conditional. The recipient must respond with a counter gift or service, and numerous and popular conventions governed the behavior of both benefactor and recipient to regain the advantage. The recipient was obligated not merely to reciprocate, but to outdo his benefactor in generosity, to outdo him. So in this kind of culture, people of higher status use their wealth to shore up their network, to build alliances, and to secure power. It was the ideal way to form factions. It was the ideal way to form factions. You see, there were those in Corinth who wanted to put the Apostle Paul under their debt. And whereas the average member of the Corinthian society would have said, thank you very much, perceiving it as an opportunity to move up in the social ladder, Paul said, no, thank you. If he received support, he understood that he'd be reduced to a peddler of the gospel, that he'd be obligated to serve the interests of his wealthy patrons that he'd lose his voice and authority to speak into the lives of the weak and the poor. When we fast forward to 2 Corinthians, we see there that Paul's refusal to receive support didn't go over very well with the Corinthians. His voluntary poverty was a constant source of consternation to them. And rather than understanding his sacrifice as a reflection of the wisdom of the cross, they deemed it as being demeaning to Paul and embarrassing to them. So what did the Corinthians do? They gravitated towards those who would take their money. And just as it is today in first century Corinth, there was no shortage of those who were willing to line their pockets at the expense of the gospel. And so when Paul says, we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel, when he says, I am willing to go to the greatest lengths to remove even the tiniest of obstacles, Paul's talking about the Corinthians. It's not that this patronage system was a small obstacle per se, but I think you'll agree with me, it was such a petty thing. A bunch of church members wanting to increase their status and fortify their factions, that was the obstacle. And so as a result, what happened? Their apostle decided that he'd rather starve then compromise the integrity of his message. Let me tie this back to the previous chapter and I'll close with this comment. If Paul, an apostle of Christ, was willing to give up his rights, we're not talking about his rights to a fancy house we're not talking about his rights to a fancy car, to a 401k savings. If Paul's willing to give up his rights to subsistence level provisions, here's the point. How much more should the Corinthians be willing to give up their rights to eating fancy food offered up to idols in fancy social gatherings. The contrast is stark, isn't it? Paul surrenders his rights to win some to Christ. The Corinthians insist upon their rights, even if it causes their brothers to stumble. 
And I wonder if that contrast can't also be made with you. I wonder if Paul doesn't also put you to shame. I know we've looked at a bajillion questions today, but here's one more for you to consider. This is the question that you ought to ask yourself as you walk away from this text. It's very simple. What have I given up for the sake of the gospel? What have I given up for the sake of the gospel? Christ gave up his life so that in his poverty you might become rich. What have you given up for Christ? Let's pray. O gracious Heavenly Father, indeed we confess that you are gracious. Your bounty knows no end. You pour out your treasures abundantly to your people. And you ask us, but for a fraction of what we've received, not because you need those things, but so as to conform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, who made the ultimate sacrifice in his life on the cross. Father, we thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, of your Apostle Paul. We thank you that in him we have a concrete picture and reflection of your Son, Jesus Christ, of the divine heart. We ask that you would help us to indeed obey his command to imitate him. Enable us to be like Paul in being willing to give up our rights for the sake of the gospel. Enable us to be worthy of imitation. And when this world looks upon us, when others look upon us, may we shine forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we confess that this is difficult to do and our hearts are greedy. We are not cheerful givers, and yet by your grace and by the sanctification of your Holy Spirit, we, we trust that this is possible. And so by his strength, not ours, we ask that this be done. We pray all these things in the gracious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.